familiar with Raincatcher, and those of you who aren't are going to get familiar a little bit today. Raincatcher helps rapidly transform small to medium sized businesses into companies that are built to sell and turns um, helps buyers find remarkable enterprises in which to create their own legacy. So this training today, the title is What's My Business Worth and How Do I Eventually Sell It at the Best Price? And I'm going to turn it over to you, Jason. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Let me uh, share my screen. Can you guys see that? Yep. Perfect. Okay, uh, great. Um, thank you so much for letting me join you today. Um, on behalf of myself and Raincatcher, uh, I really want to thank Network in Action, um, especially Simon, Sharon, and Steven for including me. Uh, really enjoyed building a relationship with you guys. Um, today we're talking about um, how to value a business, but more importantly, we're talking about how do I eventually sell it at the best price. This is not a sales pitch to work with us as, uh, as your broker. This is what you need to do so when you do decide that eventually it is the time to sell, your business is sellable and it's sellable for the highest value possible. So our goals here today, we've got about an hour. Um, I wanna cover a lot of information. I um, wanna try and make this interactive as possible. Uh, I am gonna leave uh, probably 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. Um, if you have any during the presentation that you want um, just to jot down, just throw them in the chat section for me, please. I'll try and look at them. Uh, but I'd like to try and get through. I have some um, some questions for you during the presentation too. So um, what we're going to try and accomplish today is we're going to talk about how small businesses are valued. Uh, business sellability, um, you know, isn't just really about profit. Um, what are buyers looking for in businesses? You know, what's the state of the market today? Um, and then, you know, what do you need to do to take uh, the pro appropriate steps now to to find that exit into the future? So before we jump in, I want to tell you a little bit about our company. Um, so we're a business brokerage company here in Denver, Colorado. Um, you know, we are laser focused on helping small business owners. Um, we have the expertise to do larger transactions. So we just closed a $30 million transaction, but our focus 100% is on helping small business owners. And we typically work with business owners between one and $10 million in value. Um, I think the reason why we're there is because our processes and our systems and the way that we look at creating value adds the most benefit to that niche of uh, small business owners. Um, the business is owned by myself and my partner, Marla DiCarlo. Um, and you may ask me, why is a, a business broker here talking about creating value and preparing for an exit and not about, you know, how to sell your business, sign up with me. Uh, and the, the, the answer is really simple. Um, we look at this in a different way. Uh, if you read our mission statement, I mean, we believe that small business owners and our clients are really the heartbeat of America. Um, this is what drives our economy. This is what, um, you know, inspires us. And everyone really has, the, you know, deserves the opportunity to, to find that right exit at the, the most valuable uh, number possible and the easiest transaction too. So I'm going to jump in. Um, you know, oh, excuse me, one more. Uh, you know, this is why we think small business is so important. And I'm sure a lot of you realize this because you are small business owners, but uh, it is the backbone of this country, uh, especially in times like today with COVID. Um, you know, our small business economy drives this country. You know, more than half of our GDP is driven by small business. It creates opportunity for, for minorities, uh, creates uh, great community involvement. Um, and there's just a lot more of us than there are uh, big corporations. So uh, everyone deserves the opportunity to have that great exit. And, and that's really what we're talking about today. So how do we determine uh, what a business is worth? Uh, there's, there's multiple ways that we can do this. Uh, if you look at uh, a business in the open market, ultimately it is about what a buyer is willing to pay. So it's about positioning your business the right way preparing your business the right way, and then you know, uh, pricing your business the right way. But ultimately, it's how you negotiate and get the, biz the, the, the best price for your business. There's multiple ways to go about this. Um, I've listed a few here. Uh, is anyone familiar on, on the line um, of how to value a business? Does anyone um, have experience in this? Anyone pick out which is the most common uh, valuation methodology? I think it's the EBITDA, right? Multiple of EBITDA? 
It is. Yeah, that there's multiple ways to, you know, to look at it. And when we do an analysis of a business, we look across the spectrum, but traditionally, or, or you know, most of the time it comes back as really what is the multiple of cash flow. Um, so the multiple of earnings methodology is, you know, it's a really important component. There's two ways to look at it. Um, you can look at your EBITDA, uh, which is basically your baseline, your earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. But most of the time in the small business market, it's looked at, at as the seller's discretionary earnings. Seller's discretionary earnings is really what is the total consideration, the total cash and benefits that an owner receives in their business um, historically through cash flow. Um, that's EBITDA plus what we call our addbacks. Um, addbacks run the gamut, but the rules typically stay the same. Um, they're one-time non-recurring expenses and um, they're non-business related expenses. There's a couple of rules here when we're, we're talking to buyers that, and when we're putting addbacks in our valuation, they have to be clearly non-business related. They have to be documentable, meaning we have to be able to uh, find a paper trail and prove them. And then, you know, it's a lot of work, so they have to be significant. We're not gonna add back a $50 charge or a $200 charge. We wanna make sure that they're significant to warrant the time and the energy that goes into it. So um, is anyone familiar with, with add backs? Have you, um, do you run, does anyone run personal expense? I'm not the IRS. Um, does, does anyone run personal expenses or non-business essential expenses through their business? And can you come up with an idea of, you know, what would be an ad back in this situation? Maybe like that you're paying for your, um, like your groceries or your, yeah. your home, or yeah, maybe the rent, like your residential rent expenses. Yeah, we see that a lot. Um, we also see uh, personal cars run through the business. Mm -hmm. So uh, owners will pay their lease, their insurance repairs through the business. Um, travel, um, not mm -hmm. business related travel. Uh, say you run, you, you take your family on a trip to Hawaii you run it through the business, but you have a construction company here in Denver, um, not business related. Um, children on payroll that aren't working in the business is another popular one that we see. And, and look, this is commonplace. A small business owner in the small business market, the goal is to reduce your, your tax obligation. I think we can all agree on that, uh, that we don't like paying taxes. Um, where a large corporation, um, you know, they, try, they have to generate profit so they appease their investors. Um, so it's a different, two different worlds. And so there's a lot of hidden value in, in biz, small business because you have to look for these, uh, these ad backs. Some bad examples of non-essential, non-business expenses that sometimes people try and add back. Um, you know, inventory that you're taking out of cost of goods uh, for your own personal use. That's a hard one because you're, you're writing it off as business. There's no really true paper trail there. Um, and you're doing your tax returns with, with a certain amount of cogs and a certain amount of inventory. So that's a, that's a challenging one. Uh, personal meal, meals and entertainment is a one that's added back a lot, but which gets refuted a lot because you go out to lunch, you write off a business meal, you write on the receipt business meal with John, um, and then you file your taxes that that was a business meal. Then you tell the buyer, no, no, that wasn't a business meal. That was my, my personal, uh, that was my personal meal. So that's a hard one to really justify. Um, and then the other one is, uh, non-recurring, uh, one-time expenses. So major theft in the business, major loss from a lawsuit, uh, bad debt, uh, just as long as it's not recurring every year, and it's a one-time one-off. Uh, that's, that's a good example. A bad example would be, um, capital expenditures in the business, um, training for new employees, you know, even though that may be a one-time expense for that one employee it's a recurring nature because you're going to hire and fire employees throughout um, the cycle of your business. So we take, we figured out how to, to get to our seller's discretionary earnings and we apply a multiple to it and how we come up with that multiple um, really depends on a lot of factors. Uh, the first factor is just sheer size. There's a correlation between the size of cash flow and the valuation multiple uh, that, that we look at. So, the more cash your business is generating, um, the higher the multiple you can fetch. 
Uh, lower lower uh, value, uh, lower EBITDA businesses or lower SDE businesses say under a hundred thousand dollars in earnings. You know, averages are one to to two and a half times earnings. Um, if you go up market and you're making five hundred thousand dollars a year, then it jumps to two and a half to three and a half times. Uh, and these are these are averages, not you know. There's outliers where businesses trade at five times, but this is the majority of the businesses that we look at. Um, an interesting thing happens when you hit about 1 million, not only does you, you typically switch from SDE to EBITDA, but you start attracting different types of buyers. You start getting institutional buyers, private equity buyers. Um, and so the multiples tend to start going up. So a multiple can be three and a half to five and a half times. Um, and then above 2 million, you're in a whole different ball game. You know, you're anywhere from five to, to 10 uh, times. Um, and then you get into public traded companies, which multiples can be, you know, double digits. Does that make sense for everyone? Or does anyone have any questions about SCE? Yeah, I have a question. At, yeah. When you say multipliers, are you saying, so you would take, if you're doing 500K, you would multiply 500K by the multiplier? Is that yeah, the baseline? So if your business, yeah, uh, Karen, that's a great question. If your business is making $500,000 a year, and, um, you know, it, we're just looking at the averages here. It's a good business. Um, so we'll say a, a multiple of three. So you would take 500,000 times three and your business okay. would be worth approximately 1.5 million. Okay. Thank you. Does that make sense? Aaron, I think just to, to clarify, you're talking um, 500K EBITDA, not top line revenue. Correct. Yeah. Yes. S SD, seller's discretionary earnings or EBITDA. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying, Simon. So this isn't the only factor. Uh, industry dramatically affects the multiple for a business. Um, so there's, there's, this is an important um, topic that you know the same, the business of uh, two businesses that are generating the same amount of cash flow or same amount of EBITDA, but in two different industries will trade at two different multiples just solely based on the industry. All other things considered equal. A manufacturing company tends to fetch a higher multiple than a retail. Uh, business. So financial performance, the amount of cash that you generate, and then uh, the industry that, that you're in are drivers of value. But we're going to get into truly the, um, the functions of the business that really create the most value. Um, and this is the, what I'm really excited about talking about. We're talking about maximizing value and the steps that you can take outside of just generating more profit. Um, you know, selling a business is, I think, exciting, but it's also a lifetime event for many people. So it can be really scary. Um, so it's important that you plan and execute on a strategy to exit. Uh, I think we're in a good group here that people are actually taking these steps, but a lot of times business owners come to us and they say, uh, we're ready to retire. I'm tired. My business is plateauing. Um, and they're coming to us because they're ready to sell, not necessarily because the business is ready to sell. You have to prepare the business. Um, just like Terry, you know, Terry, you can probably relate to this. You have to stage your home. It's not like you're going to just throw a house on the market without cleaning or painting the walls or doing some landscaping. I mean, preparing a business for sale is very similar. Uh, so we're going to talk about a system um, by John Warelau. Is anyone familiar with John besides Simon? So John wrote a book called Built to Sell. Uh, Built to Sell um, talks about you're preparing, you're building your business that is, is a sellable entity. Um, it's not about generating revenue. It's not about generating profit. It's about building an entity that is actually ready to sell. Um, and the foundation of that is called the value builder system. Uh, the value builder system uh, is an assessment. It's a 13 minute assessment. Um, we have our clients take it. We do not as a, as a company do consulting, but we think this is one of the most valuable things that a client can do is take this assessment. And then we work with people like Denver Business Coach to help implement on making improvements within businesses. Um, so I'm not an actual certified advisor, but my partner Marla is, and we're actually a platinum advisor with, the, um, with Value Builder. But again, we don't do the actual implementation. We just do the analysis and then recommend working with the right people. So let's talk about the, the key drivers of business value. Um, when you take this assessment, um, you get a score and the score is from zero to hundred. Most businesses fall at about 55. That's the average. 
Um, it's actually the, uh, it got cut off, but it's the little gray triangle um, at the top. Uh, Value Builders analyzed about 50,000 businesses. And this is, it's proven that businesses with a higher score uh, fetch a higher multiple. So let's just use that, um, the, the valuation multiples that we were talking about just a minute ago uh, for that same example, Karen. Um, so your business is profiting $50,000 a year. Um, you come to me and we look at this value builder score and you're on a, you have a low score, you're in the red. I would look at the valuation, the multiple range, and I would say, you know, we could go to market, but your business is going to be the lower end of that range. You're going to be in the two and a half times. So that would be a valuation of 1.25 million. If you came to me and we took this assessment and you were up in the higher side of the, the yellow, I might say, you know, let's push the higher end of that multiple. Let's push to the three and a half times. And so therefore your business would be worth say 1.75. So this is a $500,000 gap by working on uh, improvement, by working on some of these you know, different fundamentals of your business. So based on Value Builder's assessment, um, the average multiple across the 50,000 uh, businesses that they surveyed, that went through this program, the average is 3.55. If you score less than a 50, your multiple is below three. And as you can see, as your score goes up, so does the multiple. And they, they say that you know, great businesses are above 80, and the multiples that they fetch are, are much higher. Does that make sense for everybody? Because we're gonna jump into the, the, the individual drivers. I just wanna make sure the concept makes sense. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. So one of the first drivers uh, is called Hub and Spoke. Um, Hub and Spoke is, I think, probably the most important uh, driver. Uh, I'm sure Simon may agree. Uh, it's, it's the extent in which your business relies on you personally. So how dependent is this business on you? Um, the, airline, the, the name comes from the airline industry and the reliance on the hub airports. It's an efficient way to move planes around the globe, but if you have a snow event and that hub gets snowed in, what happens to the entire system? It starts to shut down, right? So um, it's, it, it works for a while, but then you get in what we call the owner's trap. Um, signs that you're in the owner's trap, um, you know, your business slows when you're away, uh, customers always come to you, uh, and your revenue has reached a plateau and it's hard to get out of that trap because, you know, not only is this, and, I, and look, I've been there, we've grown our business over the last five years and, and we definitely have had customer, you know, owner, uh, dependency. Um, but it's about how do you dif, uh, distance yourself from uh, the day-to-day -day operations and be more of a strategic leader. Uh, you know, if the business is dependent on you, uh, that is it's really stressful. You can never get away. Um, and if you are able to sell your business, which is rare, uh, the buyer is going to make a significant portion of your purchase price contingent on future performance of the business. And we call that an earnout. So, you know, when you take your business to the market, you may get a purchase price of a million dollars, uh, but you're only going to get 700,000 of that at closing. The other $300,000 is going to be contingent on how the business performs without you. So distancing yourself from the, from the business a little bit. Uh, so you're not the, the, the hub and spoke uh, for the business is, is, is really important. Again, you can see that uh, you know, the owner is doing everything. Um, I think there's, there's a, I talked about profit before, but I think this is important. There's a, there's a difference between creating profit in a business and creating value in a business. The difference is, and think about this, someone that's looking, a, a business owner that's looking to create profit, um, you know, may try to maximize their profits uh, by not hiring a salesperson and doing all the selling themselves. Um, a person that's trying to maximize profit may not hire a management team, but instead find the lowest paid uh, staff member that can simply execute on their vision. So that's not creating value. It's creating more profit because you're cutting corners, but ultimately you're growing a business that's not sellable. So these are things to consider and there's these solutions for, for all of this. Um, and you know, this system, the value builder system is one of the ways that, and there's a, a, a a myriad of different options to go through these exercises, whether it's through value or something else. 
But these are just fundamentally uh, core things that you need to be aware of uh, when thinking about what does that exit horizon look like for my business. Any questions about that? All right, I'm gonna start calling on people just to make you guys uncomfortable a little bit. Just kidding. Um, which of the following, uh, so this is a question on one of the surveys. So which of the following best describes your personal relationship with your, your customers? Does anyone have an idea what would be, what would get the highest score, the best multiple from these questions? You know, is it, I know every customer by name or I don't know any of my customers by name. I don't know any of my customers by name would be the best. Yeah, absolutely. So if you go through this exercise, you know, you don't want to be involved in the trenches. Uh, I think sometimes as small business owners, we take pride that we do everything, uh, that we're involved in everything, that we have our hands in everything, that the business runs and is successful because of us. And that's true in the early stages of a business, but at a certain point we need to start transitioning that to uh, an empowering employees. So uh, ways to improve your hub and spoke score, uh, create a system that people, that your employees can follow, uh, automate as much as possible, um, you know, if you use a CRM, you know, uh, workflows are fantastic, automated workflows, um, uh, reduce reliance on you. And more importantly, you know, take a vacation, get out of the business, see how uh, it does when you're not there. Uh, how does your team perform uh, when you're not around? A uh, quick exercise for you guys, and you don't have to talk out loud, but just some of the mental note, you know, think about the last year. Uh, what have you done to make your, your business less dependent on you? What steps have you taken in the last year to distance yourself from the business? Um, and then think about, okay, if I haven't, or if I have, what am I going to do in the next 90 days to make myself uh, more distance from the business? You know, what steps can I take uh, to improve that, um, that hub and spoke system? All right, moving on. Um, the Switzerland structure, uh, I think, is a great one. It's just being about being independent. Um, you you want to be uh, independent from your customers, your suppliers, your employees. You don't want to be over reliant on any one of these these three categories. Um, if one of your customers makes up more than fifteen percent of your revenue, uh, that's a problem. I've seen many deals fall apart uh, in. Um, you know, in diligence or even before you get to diligence because buyers just aren't interested in taking on that risk. And if they are, we're going to talk about risk a little bit. If they are, they're going to put a heavy discount on your business and that's not really creating value. Um, so customer concentration is important. Um, you have to be able to switch between suppliers without impacting your business. And then one of the harder ones to really work on is the reliance on key employees. You know, you can't be too reliant on one or two key employees. You have to have a very solid employee base. And look, these are things that you have to grow into. It's not something that you can do on day one, right? If you're a small firm with a few people, um, you know, you have to be reliant on your key employees. But think about scale, think about growth, think about how you're going to get to a point where you can sell so you can you know, move on to the next things in your life. A good example, uh, I'll run through this quick. This is uh, Jason Freed. Jason owned a um, uh, a web design company, uh, and they were beholden to large corporations. He had very few customers. He had $60,000 accounts, but he was absolutely at the service of these big clients and he hated it. So he created a project management software, pivoted his company. He sold less to more. He grew his web shop um, into a uh, project management software and he grew his business to 15 million users. Um, and he no longer has a customer concentration issue. So it's about solving for the problem. And here's a quote from Jason, you know, when you have a consulting business, um, you know, you're beholden to the giant corporation who's paying you $60,000 for a project. You know, he's taken back control um, and he has that and, you know, he offers lots of products to lots of people. So, or sorry, uh, he offers the best products to, to lots of people. And that's just one way to pivot your business to make it uh, less reliant on, on one large customer. Uh, ways you can improve uh, your score. Does anyone have any ideas on, um, you know, ways to improve your Switzerland structure? Any thoughts? 
I was thinking about like cross training your staff so that um, multiple people can do multiple different jobs. Yeah, absolutely. So if that one key employee goes away, someone's there um, to step up to the plate. Uh, what about putting major systems in place so that everything is done the same way every time? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So that's not, you're not, um, you're not so dependent on one employee because you have a repeatable process and you can bring and train, you know, people to take over that process. But if you have one key employee that has all the knowledge, um, and you don't have it processed out, you don't have a roadmap for to train someone or to hire someone, then, you know, that's definitely risky. So one thing to think about with your firms, uh, write down all of your employees, uh, rank them from most difficult to replace to least difficult to replace. You know, if you have 10, one through 10, and then think about, you know, what are you going to do uh, if that one person, number one, goes away? And then you know, how are you, uh, you know, creating less dependence on that person? And then also think about, and this is the positive spin, think about how do you create, keep them engaged and loyal to the corporation or to the company. You know, if that person's really important, you know, think about the golden handcuffs. You know, is it profit interest? Is it equity? You know, what gets them involved for the long haul? So just an idea for you to think about um, as a takeaway. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what is the difference with respect to this particular conversation between W-2 employees and 1099 contractors? Uh, and Terry, you're a, uh, you do uh, staging, correct? All right. Yeah, that's a hard one. I mean, having, you can't really tell 1099 contractors what to do. Um, uh, so. Right. And so it looks like, I mean, yikes from everything I'm seeing so far, you, people that are just like a solo person in their business, a sole proprietor kind of person, that's not a sellable business. <clears throat> so it, it can be, um, but in that, that's going to be, it's going to affect the, well, it either isn't, or it's going to be at a lower multiple. Um, you need to have, or the other option is that you're going to need to stay on for a long period of time to transition that business over to the next buyer. And then the other consideration there is that is someone buying a business or are they buying a job? It's a distinction. Are they coming in to take over your job? Because who's going to, if, if they want to buy it as an investment, who's going to run it? So uh, you need to have, you know, think about bringing people in in house and um, you know, building that, that core team. It doesn't have to be a, you know, a large number of people. It could be three or four people, but enough to where a buyer can come in and see that, the business is self-sustaining without you. And then in regards to the uh, 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 concentration on employees, I would just make sure that you have multiple 1099 contractors that you go to, uh, not just, you don't just have one crew that helps you, that you have, you know, because what if that crew goes away? Um, you want to make sure that you have some diversity there. So if you're a full proprietor, you could do things like have good systems in place and make what you do repeatable. Correct. So, yeah, and that that would be another way to do it, I would guess, right? Correct, and then it's, it's also, and we'll talk about it, how are you creating your revenue? Um, you know, is your revenue recurring? Is it contractual? Um, is that revenue stream gonna be there with, with or without you? Um, you know, if you're just a um, project-based, one-off, uh, you know, just, you, you just each project is leads to the next one and there's no consistency there and it's just you, that's going to be really hard to sell. But if it's just you and you have contracts to service a, a variety of customers and that goes on into the future, that's a different story. I see. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about financial performance because this is, you know, I think really important. We talked a little bit about it before, um, but multiple goes up in lockstep with size. So, as the business gets larger, the multiples are going to be going up. And that's just the fundamental of, of business valuation. But the financial buyer who's going to come in and buy a small business, he's concerned or she's concerned with, you know, how much profit is your business going to generate in the future? And um, how reliable are those estimates? 
So we think about that. I want to know how much profit you're going to generate and you're going to estimate how much profit you're going to generate next year, the year after, but how reliable are those, those estimates? And depending on how reliable those estimates are, they're going to apply a discount um, to, to the valuation using what we're going to say is the uh, discounted cash flow methodology. So say you're making a million dollars a year, they're going to look at that over a long-term period, say a 10 year period. Oh, sorry. And they're going to say, based on what I see in your business, it's a great business. Uh, I'm going to apply, I want a 15% rate of return on my investment for the money, the capital that I'm going to invest. This is debt service aside. Um, I'm willing to pay $5 million for those future cash flows. So we're talking about the upper end of the multiple range. It's a great business, 15% return because it's not a risky business. Um, the opposite side of that is if you don't address some of these issues and you don't work through some of the challenges within your business before taking to the market, a buyer is going to apply a much higher rate of return to your business. You know, just like us, um, the riskier the investment, uh, the, the higher rate of return we're going to want, right? So if it were me and it was a, a business that had a lot of challenges, high customer concentration or owner dependency issues, I would apply a much higher rate of return or a discount. And so that same business with these issues may be uh, only worth $2 million worth versus being worth uh, five. So we're talking about a two times multiple on cash flow versus um, a five times multiple on cash flow. So you can really see how the risk of a business, the um, uh, how far out those revenue streams can, can go and how reliable they are really drive a, a value in a business. So something to think about. Um, buyers always look for ways to discount a business. Always. Uh, that is, I think, their sole purpose in coming into negotiations is just to, you know, nitpick on everything. And that's, you know, where where good firms come in and they, you know, they're really good at negotiating. But uh, buyers are always looking under the hood and they're trying to find everything they can to to, you know, offer a discount. So it's about making sure your books are in order, making sure your you know everything is sound, uh, the fundamentals are there, so you can push back on on these things. So ways to improve your financial performance. Jason, uh, yep. Can, can I just interject one second? Because I yep. think, um, to me, this is like one of the most important concepts to understand as a business owner is that that dynamic between a buyer who is always going to try to lower the price and as a seller, you want to get the most value out of your business. And so what, what Jason is introducing when he's with these drivers is when we're saying looking under the hood, what really matters to them, that's the drivers that, that he's talking about. And we're either as a business owner, we're doing really well in those and we're able to defend our position or we're actually not and we're going to get a discount and they're and have to negotiate the price um so in all these areas that jason is highlighting it's all about the better we can perform the less you're going to get negotiated down ultimately um and really defines and gives you an idea of what these important areas are in your business that you need to pay attention to um Anyway, I just wanted to say that because I think it, I, I know when I first heard this conversation many years ago, I, I realized I understood about 10% of it. Um, but, but just conceptually, this is what this conversation really is all about. And, and it, yeah, that's, that's really true, Simon. I mean, I'm squeezing uh, weeks of work, months of work uh, in, in theory into uh, an hour long presentation. I know I'm trying to, I'm trying to get through everything. I'm going kind of quick. Um, if it's something that interests you, uh, and you, you want to understand what your score is, you want to understand, um, you know, how to improve some of these things, we'll, you know, there's opportunities to take this assessment, you know, it's, and, and just kind of have those conversations. So, um, it, it is, uh, uh, just because you may score a low score, doesn't mean it's bad. It's just, you, you have to work on these things. Um, and you're right, Simon. Uh, I, I think that there's two parts to that one is holding true to that value and then not being beaten down on negotiations, but also setting a higher benchmark. Because if you have, if all these things are cleaned up and you've got that, um, these drivers taken care of, plus the financial performance, you can, you can shoot for the stars. You can really get aggressive on multiple and there's really not much a buyer can say. So, um, 
we've seen that with many businesses where they've, you know, they've really taken the time to prepare and, you know, they hit home runs, um, which is great. So thank you for your, uh, and, and feel free to step in anytime, um, you know, if you want to make any comments. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. Are you guys finding this helpful in thinking oh, yeah. about your business? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So um, financial performance, we can increase our revenue. We can increase our margins. Um, this is an area where um, I think, you know, working with uh, a business coach or uh, a consultant, really thinking about how do you create a more profitable business model um, and then really working on those mar margins. And then the, one of the most important aspects of selling a business overall and value is your books have to be in order. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like you, you have to, um, yeah. and that's just, uh, it's a fundamental of, uh, business sale and, um, it's really important. So hopefully, and we'll talk about forming the right team here in a little bit. Uh, hopefully you have a good bookkeeper or CPA. So, uh, let's talk about growth potential. Um, Growth potential is your ability to scale. You know, how much room is there to grow this business? And in order to do that, you have to really focus on uh, the, your processes and your systems. And they have to be in the products. They have to be teachable. They have to be valuable and they have to be repeatable. So there has to be room, um, you know, meat on the bone for a buyer when they're looking at your business. Yeah, you may be able to find a lifestyle buyer that comes in and buys your business that uh, wants to run it as it's been run uh, and make 100, 200, $300,000 a year, which is great. And that's a great exit. Um, that would probably be a two times you know, type business, two times earnings. But if that same business is making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, has the ability to scale to a multi-million dollar company, you may be able to get a much higher multiple just because your business is scalable and you have that growth potential within your business. So um, you know, here's, a, here's a good example. Um, and it's a little counterintuitive. Um, if you're selling something and you, you answer most of uh, the people out there buy what I have to sell, you're like, oh, that's great. I'm selling to everybody. It's awesome. Um, but the right answer here is, you know, only a very small portion of people buy what I have to sell because there, that means there's growth potential. That means there is, you know, meat on the bone for the buyer to, to scale this thing into the, to the next level. Think about uh, a good example is Uber. I know they've taken a hit lately, uh, but it's still a good example. They started out as a, uh, a car service in San Francisco. Um, and since then, you know, they've scaled because it's a repeatable business. It's valuable and it's teachable. Um, you know, they've scaled to multiple types of cars, 50 countries, millions of trips a day. And uh, this is probably a little bit of old data, but a $50 billion valuation. Um, you know, I know they have taken a little bit of hit lately with, with COVID, but um, it's important that you think about that. You know, what does a buyer see in the future potential of my company? Any questions there? couple ideas of ways that you can um, improve your growth potential is think about what kind of products can you sell to your existing customers? You know, is there a way to diversify what you're selling to your existing customer base and, and scale there? Um, uh, you know, Terry, for instance, does staging services. You know, maybe those same customers that are her clients could be uh, potentially could be, she could have a real estate division. And then she could actually sell, uh, you know, to those, those buyers, you know, as, as, you know, to those sellers, um, and make additional revenue there, uh, entering into new geographic markets. Um, you know, I'll use, I'll pick on Terry for a minute, Terry's business, you know, staging homes, there's tons of room to scale there that can be scaled across the whole country because, you know, it's a repeatable process. It's teachable, uh, and it's valuable, right? We're talking about staging our business right now. Um, you know, I think that's, you know, Terry, you have a great business that could be scaled. Um, and then, uh, you know, entering into new demographic segments. So 
anyone have any questions about that? Or I can't solve for every, for, for everyone scaling uh, you know issues, but I'm happy to answer any questions. When you're when you're looking at this here, Jason, um, is it important to show um, the potential? Uh, to, to scale, like if you're going to a buyer and you say, hey, you know, we could go into this place or we could go into this. I'm just, I'm not, I don't have the capital or I don't have the manpower or whatnot. Yep. Um, is that important to be able to describe that? It is. It's all about telling the right story and position the business the right way. You got to have data to back it up uh, mm -hmm. and you have to be able to test it and show that that is actually possible. Uh, and it's even more relevant right now um, with what's going on in the buyer's market. I think that's a great segue. Um, buyers, there's there are buyers in the market. Uh, buyers are engaged, um, but they are they're getting more conservative. Um, lenders are getting more conservative. So if there is that growth potential, um, before you you know we could say yeah you could do X Y and Z and it's a great business and you know oftentimes because the market was so frothy people would just you know, they've vetted out, but they would just kind of take your word. Now buyers are looking for us or for the seller to prove that out. You know, yeah, prove out your projections. How'd you come up with those numbers? You know, give me the data, give me the analytics behind it. And so there's just a little bit more scrutiny um, from buyers just given what's going on. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this one's one of my favorite ones. I think this is uh, uh, a really uh, important um, conversation, the valuation teeter totter, uh, as a, you know, a startup business for us, I mean, this is one of the biggest challenges and, and we're, uh, we've solved for some of the recurring revenue nature of our business, but we're mostly transactionally based. So we make our money on transactions, they're long sales cycles. And so as we started to scale up our company, you know, cash flow was a significant challenge for us. Uh, and I think it is for most small business owners. Um, it's a really important um, conversation. So valuation teeter totter, you know, uh, the value of your business moves in the opposite direction of your cash flow needs. The more cash your business needs, the more working capital, the less valuable it is. The opposite is true. The more cash you generate, uh, the more uh, worth it is to a buyer. So think about this. A buyer has to write two checks when they make an acquisition. They have to write a check to you, and they also have to write a check for the business and the business working capital, you know, that's to pay rent, salaries, payables. If your business is generating cash on a daily basis, then it's not so much of a concern. But if your business model is built to where you have long sales cycles or you have long AR um, and he closes or she closes on day one and is not generating any cash until day 30, they're gonna have to write another check. And so the more money they have to spend, the less money you're gonna get. Uh, so there's something to think about. Um, so it's going to come out of your pocket one way or another as a seller. And I'm not being, I'm trying just to be honest about the, how these deals get done. Um, you're either going to have to leave the cash and leave the accounts receivable in your business when you sell it, or um, the buyer is going to discount your business. So um, does that make sense? Okay. So we need to we think about ways to improve cash flow in businesses. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a good example. I like this one because I, I ride motorcycles. Um, the Harley Davidson Group. Uh, you know, you think about Harley, uh, and they sell motorcycles. But the Harley's ownership group, it's just a, a club, and they have a million members paying forty five dollars each. So they're a forty five million dollar revenue company just to belong to a group of people that share a similar passion for riding motorcycles. They do not have a cash flow consideration. I mean, they, they make a ton of money um, because they've solved for that. So ways to improve your teeter totter um, is improve your cash flow, you know, tighten up those cycles, get paid faster from your clients and um, push out your, uh, your payment cycle. So if you have terms with clients, take advantage of it. If they're giving you 30 to 45 days, don't pay the bill on day one, pay the bill on day 30. Um, that's the terms they've extended to you and you have a good business relationship with them and they're okay with it, then pay them on day 30. And that gives you, and then you tighten up your AR to where you're receiving your money quicker 
and then you start solving for some of these cash flow issues. Um, it's really important. Uh, I have got a lot of clients that come to us and it's, they're very proud that they pay their bills right away. And I'm like, no, don't, <laughs> you can't pay your bills right away. I mean, you can if you have enough cash coming in, but it's important that this is a, a lever that you can pull uh, to, to give you more uh, cash within your business. Make sense? We got a couple more here. Um, this one is uh, probably the most valuable one as far as uh, being able to fetch the upper end of, of multiples. If you can create a business with recurring revenue, um, buyers absolutely just eat it up. Um, it is a really important thing in the marketplace right now. Uh, a good example, we just put a, a business out on the market, which was a mental health uh, continuing education online uh, program, uh, software as a, ser or a subscription based program. Um, we thought the business was worth 25 million. Uh, the highest offer we got was $40 million. It was over a 10 times multiple for this business um, because someone saw the strategic value, the stickiness of the revenue, and we just, you know, the stars align with the right buyer. So um, recurring revenue is, is going to let you get to that, that next level of, of multiple. Um, and a good example, home security there's two different ways to run a home security business. And this applies to all con like types of service businesses, landscaping, HVAC, plumbing. Um, there's installation. Um, and it may even apply to IT too. Uh, there's installation. You, you, know, you install 100% of your business is installation. The opposite side of that is um, uh, security uh, monitoring. So installation, and then you have monitoring on the other side. Installation is a one-time occurrence. You install, it's project-based, you install new security systems. Ma uh, uh, monitoring is recurring because every month you get, a, you get money coming in because you need to be there to rescue them if there's a problem. So the two companies of the same type of revenue, a million dollars in revenue, the one that does just installation trades at about 75 cents on the dollar for their revenue. So looking at a multiple of revenue here, they would be about a $750,000 business. If you take the monitoring business, they're recurring. They're going to be 2x revenue. They're going to be a $2 million business. Same business, two businesses making a million dollars each in revenue or gross revenue. One is two and a half times more valuable because of the recurring nature of their business. So we've recommended a lot of landscapers and plumbers and HVAC type uh, service businesses you know, get away from, and it can be a component of your business, but get away from installation and look about, look at maintenance. How do you maintain those systems? How do you get on a recurring contract with those clients? Um, that's a great way to create a recurring nature. Um, and buyers, really, that's what they look for. If I pitch a landscaping business to someone, the first question they ask me is, how much is install? How much is maintenance? Every time. Um, and it's, it's an important component. So uh, types of uh, recurring revenue, um, consumables, think about Starbucks, you know, coffee, it's not contractual, it's not obligated, but you're going back every time because coffee is a drug. I'm guilty of it, I love coffee. Um, but you're gonna go back every day. Um, and so Starbucks is a great example of a recurring nature uh, business with the consumables. Uh, sunk money consumables, think about uh, Nespresso sticking on the coffee subject. Nespresso, you buy a, a machine that's really expensive and then you got to buy the Nespresso pods over and over and over again. Uh, that's recurring in nature. Uh, subscriptions, think Netflix, um, you know, think Pandora or Spotify, any of the music services that you uh, subscribe to, uh, or uh, newspapers or magazines. Uh, sunk money subscriptions, think about, uh, I just bought a new computer uh, and then I had to pay a subscription to uh, Microsoft for Office. So, you know, you're buying the hardware, but then you got to pay for the software on a subscription basis. So that's a sunk money uh, subscription. And then auto renewals, we're all guilty of having auto renewals on our credit card that we don't even, you know, can't remember what they were. They get charged $9.99 every year until we tell them to stop. Um, and then contracts, probably the most valuable um, where you have a contractual, the, the buyer has a contractual obligation with the company to spend a certain amount of money per year and those contracts are, are out into the distance. Um, that's a, a great way 
um, uh, to, to move things forward. We sold a, uh, uh, a, a snow removal business up in the high country and they were a commercial snow removal company. And all they did was work for large HOAs and um, large communities and 100% contractual. Um, and they had three year contracts and we had tons of buyer interest because you know, there's re it's stable recurring revenue uh, on that deal. Any questions? I know I'm kind of going fast. I'm kind of pushing up on the edge of my time, but does anyone have any, any questions or any thoughts? If not, I'll keep going. Okay. Um, monopoly control is the next one. A uh, factor to think about is, you know, how much market share do you have? Um, if you have market share uh, or a monopoly in that marketplace, you tend to get a higher multiple. I mean, it's, it's fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, I believe someone said that they were in web design. Uh, it was on the call or, or maybe Karen. IT. Karen. Um, so this is a good example, Karen. Um, so uh, there's about 25,000 graphic design firms in the United States. Um, most graphic designs, um, there's nothing uh, besides, you know, being a good graphic designer that differentiates you from the other 25,000 competitors out there. So you rely on billing by the hour, uh, referrals, and then it's hard to scale that business. Contrast that with the gentleman from Ethos 3, Scott uh, Swerty. He decided that he's a graphic designer, but he's going to focus, laser focus in, in uh, has anyone read the one thing? Uh, great book. I would recommend you read it. Uh, he focused on one thing and that was presentations. So they took their business from a graphic design business and they focused only on presentations and they were the best at presentations. And so they were able to scale because there weren't many people focusing on kind of a, you know, an unglamorous corner of the graphic design business and they were able to scale. Now they have clients like Coke and Google and NBC and it's turned into a multi-million dollar firm. So Scott's quote is, you know, we don't market ourselves as a designer. Um, we're presentation experts. So think about that. You know, think about how you set yourself apart in a crowded environment. Um, create a better mousetrap or, or better marketing strategy. Um, wh what makes you different? Um, and then think about, you know, what people care about. Um, if you're in, um, my friend just launched a diaper subscription company. Great. It's consumable. It's recurring revenue. It's the market's never going away. Everyone needs diapers, but it's also, you know, there's competition. You've got some larger companies in there. So they differentiated themselves by um, their value proposition. Their name is, is Abby and Finn. And it's, uh, it's an anagram about uh, giving back to the community. And they, so they donate diapers for every diaper they sell. And so that was their value prop and it's worked really well. Um, so think about that. How can you differentiate yourselves um, among a competitive landscape? Your thoughts, questions? Okay. Uh, this is the last one uh, of, as far as customer satisfaction or the, the uh, value drivers. Um, customer satisfaction. This is really talking about um, how do customers view your business? And someone that says that they're satisfied is not an indication that they're actually going to give you a referral or buy from you again. Yeah, I'm satisfied, but I may buy from your competitor tomorrow. Yeah, I loved your working with your business, but there, I have no allegiance. So a gentleman that used to work for Bain came up with what we call the net promoter score. And the net promoter score is a way to uh, use a survey to determine how likely someone is on a scale to refer or repeat uh, business with you. So um, the net promoter score is <clears throat> basically a, a scale of zero to 10 that you can take, you can actually take this, there's all sorts of softwares out there that you can take this um, and send it out to your clients. You know, how likely are you to um, you know, purchase from us again or how likely are you to uh, refer us to a friend? I think it's the right question. Um, zero, uh, nine to 10 on that scale of zero to 10 is what we call promoters. Um, seven to eight are what we call passives and then zero to six are what we call detractors. So to get your net promoter score, you take the number of people that said, man, nine out of 10 times or nine out of, I'm nine out of 10, I'm going to refer your business. 
um, you take those people, you get rid of all the passives, and then you, you really focus on the detractors, people that weren't really that happy, and that gives you a net promoter score. This is a great way to test how likely people are to refer or purchase from you again and how satisfied they are with your business. Um, and you look at, this is the line of most companies, the line of their growth. Um, companies that have high net promoter scores typically scale at a much higher rate. Uh, these are all uh, really high net promoter score companies. A, a world-class net promoter score is, is 50. Uh, industry standard is 10 to 15%. So an exercise that you can go through to really test the market to see how people feel about your company. Um, and really the way that you do that is you measure your net promoter score, but you focus on the detractors. Focus on what, not that people are singing you praise, but you focus on what people are saying negative. You know, oh, I didn't like the food or the music was too high or, you know, the sales guy was you know, sleazy, whatever that, you know, that, and there's all sorts of software to aggregate that data and give you some, some really good feedback. Any questions about the net promoter score? Okay. Um, so just really want to highlight a few really important key takeaways that I think um, you, know, you need to focus on here. Industry and revenue are important, but not the only things. Hopefully you saw that there's many other things that drive value in your business. If you can figure out how to create recurring revenue in your business, it's like gold. Um, it's really important. Um, focus on selling less stuff to more people. Um, you know, and that allows you to, uh, to scale also, um, you know, allows you to, um, not be so in, uh, dependent if you're selling uh, a ton of stuff and, uh, it has to have some intrinsic knowledge of the industry. It's, it's very easy to understand. Um, you know, focus on a great net promoter score, just no reliance on employees, customers, suppliers, or yourself. Um, and then, you know, you always have to leave some meat on the bone for the, uh, the buyer. So the best time to think about selling is when you're on the up and when there is more room to grow, uh, because that's when buyers uh, really uh, jump on the opportunity. All right. So um, where, where are we right now um, with COVID and selling businesses? Um, we are, uh, we are, we are transacting businesses. Uh, buyer interest is definitely there. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's, definitely been a shift in mentality. We were very, very um, high multiples, you know, very aggressive buyers, very uh, aggressive sellers uh, going into COVID. Uh, things are starting to settle out a little bit. Uh, multiples are slowly probably going to creep down, um, it, but buyers are really only looking for really good businesses um, where before they were kind of, you know, there was marginal buyers out there that would look at opportunities that you know, weren't perfect, but now it's really important to focus on, um, you know, differentiating yourself. So one of my favorite childhood exercises uh, is, you know, finding where's, Wal you know, finding Waldo. And I, 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 it's kind of a joke, but it's, it's, this is serious. Um, you know, this is the, the landscape right now with selling a business. You know, how do you stand out among all the businesses that are out there? And Simon's looking real hard. <laughs> how do you stand out among all the businesses that are out there? How do you differentiate yourself? Um, one is working with a great brokerage team, you know, creating a great marketing strategy, identifying the right buyer, telling the right story, but that's only going to get you so far because if a buyer looks at your business and they see that, um, you know, it's not in tip top shape, it's not staged, not ready. You know, they're going to move on. There's lots of options out there and there's Waldo by the way. Um, and so that's, you know, it's really important that we focus on standing out in the crowd. Um, you only really get one good bite of the apple when you go to market. And if you don't get a good exposure the first time around, uh, there is what we call buyer fatigue or deal fatigue in the industry. Um, if, if your deal just sits there, uh, it starts to, you know, starts to uh, get less attractive. Uh, people start thinking that something's wrong with it. So we want to push the market real quick. Uh, create a lot of enthusiasm, have multiple buyers come to the table, show them that they're the best business on the market and they need to buy it. Um, and so we have to figure out how to differentiate 
Uh, and the way that you do that is really you know, making sure that um, your business is set up for success. So uh, let's talk about you know, types of buyers out there and think about this as you look at the size of the company. Um, buyers for small businesses, you know, uh, typically are financial buyers, uh, first time business buyers, you know, serial entrepreneurs, or, you know, in some small cases, existing companies that are adding on your business as a strategic add on. Once you go up market a little bit, you start, um, you know, talking about private equity, institutional buyers. Um, and I'm going to use this again. I, I love this with, uh, with Terry. I'm glad you're in the room. Uh, you know, I use this analogy with our sellers all the time. You know, when you sell a house, you don't just go throw it on the market. You, you do a deep clean, you stage it, you touch up the paint, you fix any outstanding issues because you know, when you get to the inspection or the inspection objection, the buyer's just going to ask for a bunch of stuff. So why not we fix those issues up front? We are in control of those issues. We take and take as much time as we need to fix them. And so when we do have a buyer, we're in control of that process and we can just hammer right through it and, and really drive a, a ton of, of value. Um, one other thing important is what's going on in the marketplace right now is the SBA. Um, the SBA is a small business administration. They do what we call 7A loans. Most of this, the businesses under $5 million in value uh, get 7A loans for the acquisition. The underwriting criteria uh, is definitely shifting to more conservative. So what that means is it's going to be more important that businesses are in tip top shape, their financials are, are secure um, and have been um, reviewed and there's no questions there. And then same thing with buyers are going to need to have strong financials and operational experience. Um, you know, this is happening fairly rapidly. There's some great incentives right now for buyers uh, to buy businesses. Um, right now through September 27th, if you close on a transaction with the SBA, they're going to pay the first six months of principal and interest payments on those loans. Um, I think that's going to get extended. Uh, so, you know, probably through the next, I would hope for the next year. Um, but we're waiting on, on, on feedback from the SBA on that. But so one more time, uh, just things you know, think about that reduce value and also create value is addressing these issues. You know, you have to think about um, the comp competition in the marketplace, regulations in your space, uh, your cost customer concentration and solving for that. Um, you think about products and your service lines, uh, suppliers, your market position. These are all the things that you need to think about when you're preparing for what comes next. And that is, you know, preparing for that exit down the road. So next steps, um, and my, my biggest recommendation to, to business owners mm -hmm. is set your goals <clears throat> and your timelines. What is, what is your ideal timeline? Is it five years out? Is it three years out? It's never too early to start thinking about these processes and thinking about what that goal is and start planning accordingly. So what is your optimal exit date? What do you want to get for a price when you exit? Uh, where are you today? So one of the things I want to offer to you guys is just um, a takeaway from this. If you, if you're interested, you know, and just as a service, if you're interested and want to get a baseline valuation for your company and have a conversation about, okay, what is my company worth today? That's something we're happy to do for you. Uh, there's no charge. There's no hooks. You know, it's not a, um, a way to get you to sell your business through us. It's really to help you make a decision on what are the next steps you need to take to really plan for that exit. Um, and then once you know where your dates are in the future, start working backwards for us. If you were to work with us and sell your company, it's going to take us every bit of six to nine months to, to sell your company and even maybe even a year. So back off a year from your target date and then, all right, how long is it going to take me to improve on my business, uh, to get it in sellable shape. So it's never too early to start. Um, and I recommend the first step is setting a goal and then working backwards from there. Other thing to uh, take into consideration is your team. This isn't a, you know, this isn't a, just a one, one person role, right? It's not just hire a business broker and sell your company. You need the right advisor to help you get there. You need the right CPA or accountant. Um, you need the right transactional attorney. There's a big difference between attorneys 
generalists or litigators and someone that focuses on business acquisitions and transactions. Uh, who's your wealth advisor? What are you going to do with those funds post closing? It's never too early to ha start having those conversations and figuring out who your team is that's going to guide you in this journey. Um, you know, who's your lender right now? They also they often times can underwrite the deal for the buyer. So getting that all shored up. And then obviously, you know, someone that's going to help lead you through the process of the actual negotiations and exit. So with that, that's all I have for today. Um, you know, I think it's important as a takeaway, you need to understand where you are today. So my recommendation is I'm happy to do evaluation for you. Happy to, um, you know, have those conversations off, uh, offline if you're interested. Uh, you can also take the sellability assessment on our website just to get an understanding of where you, you, you land on that sellability assessment. But I recommend, you know, Denver Business Coach and, and the team here because they're the ones that look at the results of the sellability assessment and they're the ones that provide the roadmap to improving your business. So uh, two takeaways for you, um, you know, feel free to come to me. I, I'll, my contact information is here and Sharon can share it if you ever wanna talk. I'm happy to just be an advocate um, and help you plan uh, for your exit. That's all I got. <laughs> awesome. Any questions? I wanna leave it open for, uh, for some Q&A if anyone has any specific questions. I just I have do. a comment. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Terry. All I was going to say is when I looked at the topic for today's business lab, I thought this doesn't apply to me. Um, and I had invited uh, someone to join us today and I sent her the information and she thought that doesn't apply to me. And the fact of the matter is I'm so, so happy that I got this information today. Um, and I, I mean, are, it's things I never ever thought of and never thought would apply to yeah. me and my business and that it, I wouldn't ever be able to do anything like this, but it looks like there's all kinds of way to put yourself in a position for good things later. So thanks yeah, so absolutely. much for all the information. And I will tell Miss Lori James, she messed up. <laughs> well, thank you, Terry. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm glad that it you know, provides some value to you. Uh, thank you. I, I have one question. Right at the end there, you threw in a, a thing that you didn't really talk about, reason for selling. So what are some good examples of good reasons for selling and bad reasons for selling? Bad reasons for selling. Uh, you're tired. You don't want to work in the business anymore. Um, you don't like what you do. You burn out. Um, okay. you're having employee issues, revenue is starting to, to go down. Um, you know, I had that, made that comment about, you know, leaving meat on the bone, you know, leaving runway, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. I've, I've dealt with many business owners over the years and the, in the last year I've had several conversations with business owners. They're like, all right, I'm just going to push one more year. It's been great. We're making tons of money. And then COVID happened. Right. I mean, who's who could have predicted a pandemic? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's important that, you know, on the way up, you, you know, it's a great time to sell. You're making great money. Don't get greedy. You know, don't don't you know, if you have a few more years in the tank. That's fine. But you know, don't you know, we see where people get in the trap of just trying to push one more year, or push one more year just to make a little bit more money and they mm -hmm. end up regretting it. Uh, Long winded answer. Uh, good reasons to sell. Um, you know, you've gotten the business to a certain point, you, um, you've created the processes, you've created the systems, you've got the team, but you're just really not prepared to take on the, the risk associated with growth capital. Um, we've seen that, uh, I sold a, a, a pretty large, um, microbrewery, uh, uh, and they, you know, they created this great brand and they just, they're, they're in the, the later parts of their career and they just didn't want to take on the risk of, you know, buying another facility. And that's a great reason to sell. Find the right mm -hmm. partner that wants to take that risk, that has the, the capital and, you know, there's opportunity there. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it did. Thank you. Very helpful. Okay. I want to highlight, Mary, I want to highlight this because we also have Derek here and Sarah as well. You know, I think for a lot of, um, 
business owners, the majority of their wealth really is tied up in the value of their business. And even, you know, at some point they just want to mitigate risk, uh, take some chips off the table, maybe bring in a partner, but, but secure their cash and not have it all tied up in like one asset and diversify a little bit. So I think for Mary, Sarah, Derek, like that's definitely a conversation to, to introduce with, with clients also. Um, yeah. I think th uh, just to dovetail you. on that, Simon, um, when you sell, you don't, there's opportunities to, if you love what you do, but like Simon said, you want to take some chips off the table. There's, there's tons of opportunities to go out and sell and you know, pull some capital out of the business roll some equity into the new entity that's buying your company and partner with those buyers um, and then work with the business into the future. You're still an equity holder. Most of the time you give up majority control, but you know, you may sell 80% of your company, roll 20%, take some of that risk, put that money into other investments or you know, towards retirement. And you know, but you're still, you're still moving things forward. You're still involved. And that happens a ton. Uh, 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 equity rolls are really common. Um, because the buyer, you think about it, the buyer wants you to be part of the, the business moving forward. Thank you very much. Very helpful, both of you. Yeah. Hey, Clint. A quick question. Um, ESOP. I'm, a, I'm in an industry that in roofing businesses aren't, they are bought and sold in roofing, but it's, it's not near as common as other industries. Yep. Um, construction industries, I've noticed, you know, some of these bigger construction firms have gone in an ESOP model for, for, for getting the ownership out. Mm -hmm. um, you, would you guys care to touch on that or is that totally off topic of kind of your... It's not, it's not off topic. It's, uh, you know, I talk about the one thing. It's not in my, uh, I don't know if Simon or Steven have any, any comments here. Um, it's not in my expertise, so I don't pretend that I know uh, how to execute and the right strategy for that. Um, but I've got great relationships with firms here in Denver that do focus on ESOPs. And if you'd like, I can, you know, make a recommendation to someone to talk to. Okay. But it is a good strategy. I mean, it's, it's a successful strategy sometimes too. Okay. Hey, Jason, I have a question basically as to, you know, you, what I've always wondered about a person in your position as a broker is, you know, you have these different businesses, you know, you have a landscaper, you have an insurance guy, you have, you know, these different businesses, you know, not to give away the secrets of your, your trade, but I'm wondering, you know, what your, how, you know, how you're kind of going about finding the buyers or what, you know, somebody in your position doing to uh, begin, begin with the sale of a company. Yeah. Um, so not all firms are created equal in our space. Um, there's, uh, you know, a lot of one-offs um, where I think we excel is in our marketing strategies um, and our processes. So yes, we have, <clears throat> we work with landscapers. We work with a lot of blue collar. Uh, I just like blue collar businesses. We work with a lot of construction niche verticals, um, done concrete equipment, uh, excavating, snow removal, equipment rental. Um, it's just the manufacturing distribution. It's just a, a segment that we really like, but we also do B2B services and technology and so when you look at that, it's, it's really a wide gamut, right? So the way that we go about it is the most important thing is the process. How do you create buyer attention? How do you market appropriately to where you can get to a point where you put a deadline in front of buyers and you have multiple buyers sitting at the table at the same time? That's ultimately what it comes down to because when you do that, you can negotiate the best terms, the best price, and the owner actually has options on who they want to turn the keys over to. So our, I think that transcends industry. Um, but how we you know, go about finding the right buyer is a couple of different things. I mean, we, we have a pretty robust buyer database that we've cultivated over the last five years. So internally, we have a database we can go to that we can segment out and say, I have, you know, a thousand roof, roof, people that are interested in roofing companies in my database. So I could go specifically target those people. The other is, which I don't see in the small business market as much, is we build out a strategic buyer list. So we'll sit down with you as the owner and we'll think about all the businesses within your industry that could be a good fit to acquire you as a bolt-on to their existing business. Obviously, we get approval to reach out to people, but that is a good portion of the sales that we do because it's you think about synergies and fit. And most of the time, those buyers pay more money 
than just say a financial buyer. Um, and then there's all sorts of platforms out there. Uh, you know, the digital age, uh, we run pay-per-click campaigns. We, we work off of uh, <clears throat> softwares that are out in the marketplace. Um, and buyers are uh, know where to look. Um, and so that's another passive approach. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I've always wondered how, <clears throat> how that works for, for you guys. And just, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely not real estate. I mean, I know you're a broker, but it's not, you know, you guys are putting in a year of work to something with something I'm not real familiar with. So it's just, it, yeah. it does answer the question. I appreciate it. There's one more, uh, one more comment there. I think a lot of our industry as a whole is a um, just throw it up, throw it out there and see what happens kind of mentality. Um, you know, just throw it up on a listing platform and see what kind of interest you get and not much thought and work goes into it. Um, and regardless if you work with us or you work with another firm, you know, I think the questions to ask are, you know, what, how, what do you do outside of just posting a deal on biz by sale? You know, what, what are you doing to take those steps to create a, a you know, a very um, tailored marketing strategy for us to find that right buyer? Um, because, you know, again, a lot of people just throw it up there and see what happens, see what sticks. That wasn't, a, that wasn't a plug, by the way, for, for, for our business. So just... <laughs> Any other yeah. questions for Jason? Anyways, I hope you guys all heard um, the offer that he made loud and clear about um, doing evaluation and really no hooks to that. So um, I know we all learned a lot today and I imagine, you know, a lot a lot more could be gained um, if any of you want to move forward with that process. I'll be sure um, Network in Action, you all have Jason's contact information. And um, Simon, do you want to say anything in, in closing? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Jason, very much. Uh, that You're was a very um, a great presentation. And, and what I can say, I think, is as we're coming out of COVID, more or less, uh, I can tell that there's a lot of business owners that are that are tired, that have to like rebuild, they have to uh, reinvent themselves. And every small business owner is in some sort of a conversation like, do I have what it takes? Do I really want to do it again? Um, and I can't stress enough the importance of understanding these principles that Jason introduced here to if you're going to go that route and if you're going to put you know horsepower behind your business again like really make it worthwhile and and in that i think um getting a valuation of your business at this point to really see where you're at to then have a a good conversation about where do you want to go what is my timeline what am i willing to do what am i not willing to do it's just really relevant and you know that might apply to some of us that are on the call but i'm sure all of you have fellow business owners that um that are in that conversation and are in that position and i just really uh love working with jason and i i know their company does great work and it's a it's a great place to start this conversation even if you're like five um five years out ten years out um that benchmark right now is so important um anyway didn't intend to be a plug, but it turned out to be, but I just want, I know it's such an important conversation and I, I wanna thank you guys for your attention with this. Uh, thank everyone so much just for being here and spending your afternoon with us. Thank you, Jason, really just for all of your time and preparation also to be here with us today. Thank you very much. Yeah, great yeah, great you, presentation. Great, great job. job. Goodbye everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, see ya.